Good afternoon and welcome to this lecture about directory services. Uh, hopefully this is something you might have heard of at least. Uh, we could have about 10 or 20 lectures about this topic but yeah, we will scratch the surface a bit anyway and then we will have some demos on how to install and, and configure it later on. So this is uh, the content of today's lecture. We'll talk a bit about um, what a directory service is uh, in a broader term and then we'll look into one specific implementation, Active Directory. Uh, so a directory service, uh, you can say that it's a, a database for storing network resources. Uh, each of these different uh, resources are considered an object and every object has a lot of different attributes. Um, we usually implement security with the directory service uh, when we add users and, and uh, passwords and then we can use this information to secure our network devices and units. We also define a, a namespace for our network. So we set an, up some rules for how naming uh, should be done. These rules also specify that names has to be unique and unambiguous, so they can't, you can different one object from one another. Uh, this is usually called the distinguished name, the specific name uh, for one object. We'll talk a bit about uh, the distinguished name uh, further on. Uh, so what's the information that's included in a directory service? Well, that can differ uh, quite a lot. Uh, but we usually have this shared information infrastructure uh, to make it easier to locate different units or resources. It makes it more efficient for us to manage and administer these different objects, organize them. If we have a big organization, we need some sort of organization uh, to manage all these objects. And what is a network resource? Well, it can be a lot of different things. Uh, here's just some different. This can be files and folders, printers, users, groups, uh, computers, servers, a lot of different things can be stored in this uh, service. Uh, of course, we have some sort of protocol uh, when talking about directory services. Uh, one of the first was X500, uh, and it's a quite big uh, standard. Uh, but when we are using a directory service uh, on a network, uh, we usually use the IP internet protocol, and then we have the LDAP protocol that we usually work with. Uh, LDAP is an open standard, uh, which a lot of different vendors have contributed to, to make this up. And it's a small subset of the X500. Uh, and what we can do with this, well, we can have, we have a client part and a server part. Uh, and the client can ask questions and search this directory information, uh, this directory service for information. Uh, the protocol also specifies how to add, manage, and delete different entries in this database. Um, as I discussed before, we have this distinguished name. Uh, this is how we make the, the path for the, the specific object. And it has this uh, specified format. So at the further left you go, the more uh, near the object you get. And on the right side you have the container or the, the server, the name. Uh, and as you see, these are specified with different uh, classes. Uh, so we have an user, I think, John Doe, that exists in one domain, example.com. If we want to er organize these more into, uh, group, uh, into folders, we use something called organizational units. 
So now the John Doe user is in a organization unit called department and is in the same domain still. So the format can be a bit hard to understand in the beginning, but it's, you will see these examples quite a lot. So now I've been talking about directory service in general. We have a lot of different implementation of this. Uh, Active Directory is by far the most commonly used. I read somewhere that in the top thousand companies in the world, uh, Active Directory has a, about 90% market share. So all big companies are using Active Directory in some point. Um, and we have a lot of others. And they have the implementation is quite different from each other. They all uh, implement the standard of LDAP, so you can ask questions the same way to the different servers. Uh, but the different features and other stuff you get with the directory service uh, will differ quite a lot. So from now on, I will talk about Active Directory, since that is the, the, the biggest one of them. And Active Directory uh, first came out in with Windows Server 2000, I think, the year 1999. And it's included in the operating system, the server operating system. So when you install Windows Server, then you can add a, a feature uh, called Active Directory Services. Uh, and with Windows Server 2008, they divided up uh, these different services. Uh, so they have five different services that I call Active Directory and then Directory Services, Lightweight Directory Service, Certification Services, Federation Services, and Rice Management Service. Uh, so they are quite different from each other, and we will only discuss this one, actually, the Domain Services. The other you might have heard of Adam, Active Directory Application Mode, which was a way to have a lightweight directory service without the, uh, the authentication part. You can use it to store information. If you had an, you've written an application, you can use this Adam service uh, to store data. And that's uh, now called Active Directory Lightweight Directory Service. The certifi certification services, I will talk about certificates in the security lecture, <coughs> but that is a, a service to create certificates, sort of say, a certificate authority. The federation services is how to um, connect the different Active Directory. Uh, if my company has an Active Directory uh, and I want to authenticate users from other companies, I can integrate these services together. Um, and right management services is for information security. So we can set up what this file, uh, uh, what happens with it, uh, which user opened it, uh, what can you do with it, and stuff like that. But we will focus on the domain services. And what can you do with Active Directory domain services? Well, quite a lot of different things, depending on the, the, the client part. So we have here in the middle the Active Directory, which is a centralized database, which can handle security and a lot of different uh, things that you might need. So for a, a user, it can store account information, uh, what the user can do in this company, which file it can access and stuff like that. We can implement policies to make sure that the user uh, can't uh, change background on his desktop or uh, it will automate installation of programs on, on his machine. And for a server, it's about the same, but you can also manage printers and shares. Um, we can write our own applications, which store its configuration in Active Directory if we wanted to. We can, 
get single sign on if we want in my application, and that is that if I have been authenticated with my Active Directory, then when I open the application, I will be logged in as that user. And a lot of different other, uh, things. Uh, we have <coughs> the email server uh, could store information about the mailboxes and the address book and stuff like that. They have Microsoft had their own my mail server called Exchange, which is heavily dependent on Active Directory. It stores a lot of information in Active Directory. So, as you can imagine, Active Directory has a database. It is a file uh, that's called uh, ntds.dit, and it contains of three different partitions, you can say. The first one is the schema, uh, which is, well, you haven't discussed databases uh, yet, but it defines the different objects that you can store, you can say. It has these classes. Uh, it could be um, a user. And then it uh, defines attributes like uh, telephone number or last name, description, that you then connect to the classes. Well, you don't, the uh, Active Directory does that for you. But you could extend this schema if I wanted to store some specific information uh, in my, from my application, then I will update the schema and make changes to it, and then I can store this information. We have the configuration partition, which holds something stored uh, um, named forest wide configuration. We'll get to that in a bit. Uh, also the sites which we'll get in, and here you see exchange global settings, which is connected to the the, the mail server, and also mailbox policies, and a lot of different configuration. And then at the bottom, we have the domain partition, which stores all the, the actual objects, the data in the objects. So computer users, printers, and stuff like that. So when talking about Active Directory, we usually talk about two structures, the logical structure and the physical structure. And the logical stru structures has four different object types. You have domains, organization, unit, trees, and forest. Uh, and this is just to help us how should we set up our Active Directory uh, domain. And then we have a physical structure, which is more how should the network be, uh, how should uh, uh, the servers who are handling this service be connected. Uh, if we have multiple locations, where should we store these databases? Uh, and <clears throat> when talking about the logical structure, we usually want it to reflect the structure of the organization. So now we're talking about companies with, well, at, at least 20 uh, users, 20 employees. Uh, before that, you would have probably have some specific need if you wanted to use Active Directory, because you need an administrator to handle uh, this service and it wouldn't be uh, that effective to, to have that if you have a small organization. So as you can see, this is, for, this is very scalable and you can have it for millions of users if you have an organization with that. Uh, but as I said, it should reflect or mirror your organizational structure. Uh, I will come to the details in a bit. But the, the smallest part uh, that we, uh, in the logical structure is the organizational unit. Here you can, you can say that it's like a folder or directory where you can store the different objects. So you can store a user account, uh, a printer account, or a network share, and the information that. And these can be in a hierarchy. So you can have an organizational unit inside an organizational unit, and so on. So it, it could be like a file structure here. So the, the main thing here you could say is for the organizational uh, part. Uh, to be able to, to realize how we should do the structure of the organizational unit, we need to know something about group policy. And group policy, we also could have a couple of lectures about, but I will only have one slide on it. Uh, and that is, a centralized way for 
administrators to ensure that our clients and users have their environment uh, restricted. So we can say an administrator is creating something called a GPO, a group policy object, and that contains information uh, about this, this policy. And this policy could be an, an easy policy, it could be uh, I want the specific uh, icon on every uh, computer. When they are logged in on the desktop, we want this icon and this shortcut for our web page or something like that. So you create that GPO and then we connect it, <coughs> we could connect it to an OU, an organization unit, a domain or a site. And it has two parts. It, it could I, either be configuration for a user account or for a computer account. So if we say that is an, an user, so all the user that are inside that organizational unit or further down the chain will get that shortcut on their uh, uh, desktop. And what things you can do with group policy are almost endless. You could change the whole look of the operating system and you can install software with it. You can install entire um, operating system. Uh, the biggest drawback here is that it's only available for Windows clients. We could uh, connect Linux and uh, OS X to uh, Active Directory domain, but we won't get this feature, the group policy feature. Uh, so you will have a lot of different GPOs probably in your company. And that is for your management to decide which different policies we want. Uh, and for the, uh, the IT personnel also. It could be to help them, okay, we have a, a new user coming to the company. Uh, he is going to work in the sales department. We get a new computer, we connect that to the domain, and then we put the computer account in the correct organizational unit. And when that computer starts up, it will install all software that he needs for that task that he's in, or the, the department. Uh, and make all the bookmarks and stuff like that available for users. So when he comes and start work, he has all the same things that his colleagues has in his own uh, department. So when talking about <coughs> the logical structure again, how you should uh, create the, the structure of an organizational uh, unit, it, it mainly has two parts which you should think about when you do this and it's delegation of administration and group policies. And delegation of administration. You have a question? Yeah, the, there is a question on live coding TV. Is Active Directory the same as SSH for Windows? SSH for Windows? No, you can't say that. Uh, SSH is a way to connect to another machine uh, via a secure connection. Active Directory, well, you, you can say that you can authenticate users and, uh, and with that service and you store a lot of other information about your network. So no, it's not the same thing as SSH. Um, the delegation of administration. Uh, so let's say that we have a, a company which has uh, is located in three different cities. They have have a lot of different users and employees in the different uh, cities, but to have one administrator at each location. So if they wanted, they probably will have an structural something like this. And you can, uh, on an organizational unit, or this folder, if you say like that, uh, say that this user uh, can create users, it can modify users, uh, it can yeah, make anything in this organizational unit. But it can't do that in one of the others. So as you realize, if you want to delegate administration, you have to have a specific structure so it 
will reflect that organization. If I've organized all my uh, marketing, if I just created an organization unit for marketing and placed all my users there and didn't reflect which, uh, which city it was in, an administ administrator for the Talmar department could, uh, would have to have uh, all the privilege as uh, another administrator. You can't identify the different parts. So you have to think about how do you want to delegate administration. In, in most com uh, companies, if you only have one administrator who's doing all this, then you don't have to think about that. The second part is <clears throat> group policies. If Let's say if I wanted a group policy that says that runs an, uh, a script when a user logs in. But I only want that for uh, users who are in Kalmar and not in uh, Gothenburg or uh, Malmö. Then I have to have the users in an organizational unit that reflect that because I connect the group policy object to an organizational unit. I will have some demos about this, so hopefully it will clear things up. So when you are trying to make this structure, this OU structure, you shouldn't think that much about organization. Because if you think about the other two, you have that in mind and you create an, an OU structure, then you will get the items organized. So don't think about the organizational part, think about the delegation of administration and the group policy. There are some, some tweaks that you can do to get around this if, let's say, I wanted a group policy to be applied for all as for all the sales departments. Well, as you see here, we have divided up the sales into the different uh, locations. So I then have to connect the uh, GPO to each of these organizational units. A GPO can be connected to multiple uh, OUs. So if I wanted to change that later on, I only change the GPO, and then it will be reflected on all the, the uh, OUs that it is connected to. Another part of the logical structure is the domain. And the domain isn't <clears throat> what well, we talked about DNS before, and we talked about domains there. And a domain could be um, company.com. Well, here a domain is a security area. Let's say it's, a, it's an own database inside Active Directory. It's, it's here that you store the different objects. Uh, an Active Directory can, ex uh, it can be more domains. But these are then have, uh, if you create a user called uh, Johan in one, and then you create one in the other, then it's two different users. It has connected to do two different domains. But these can be a part of the, the whole structure. The domain can span over more than one physical area, as we saw before. You could have a, a one domain uh, in like this. This could be for just, uh, this is just for one domain, the corp.company.com. So each domain has its own UO structure, OU structure. So how are these structured then? Well, we have trees. So here at the top we have lnu.se, which is a domain. It's also a, a DNS domain, probably. Uh, and it has its users. And then let's say that <coughs> computer science department wanted to have their own domain. B 
we want our own users. We have our own IT guys who are administrating this uh, domain. So then we create a, a child of, uh, to that node. And an, an administrator account here can update and do stuff in this domain. But an administrator here can't do stuff in the domain above it. Uh, but there are two different databases. So a user called uh, Johan in lnu.se, if he tried to log on to cs.lnu.se, he won't be able to because it's a different account there. And they all have the different uh, group policies and the different OU structures and stuff like that. They do share the schema. So if we update the schema, uh, because we wanted some more information, we will be able to use that uh, in the different domains. They also share the global catalog, which I will come to. This will make it quite scalable if you want to, to use this. I will say that <coughs> nowadays we usually don't have multiple domains. For the most of the companies, at least here in Sweden, we won't need that. Before, we could have some restriction that the, the database become too large. It would become slow if we have a lot of objects in it. But with today's computers and uh, networks, that won't be a problem. So here at, before we were uh, LNU, uh, Linnaeus University, it was the what was we called before? Högskolan i Kalmar. Then we had the structure where uh, a lot of different departments has their own domain. But then it realized it was horrible to administer for the IT um, personnel, so they centralized that to one domain. And for most companies, you, that will be enough with just one. We also have this logical uh, unit that called uh, a forest. And then when th this is where we connect, which looks like two different domains, but they have a connection. Uh, these can't update or change stuff in between them, the administrators, but they share the, the schema, they share the, the global uh, catalog, uh, but they work independent of each other. So this is extremely large uh, organization. It could be like, say, car industry. If one big uh, manufacturer buys another, they might want that brand still, so they work very independent of each other. Then they could have this connection so that they can share resources with each other and they well, the, the big benefits of, of have, having multiple like this, but having them connected, is that <coughs> an, an IT guy in this domain, uh, let's say ha they have a lot of file servers here. He could get a user here to be able to access stuff in his domain. That's why we need this connection. Uh, and this is the same for all of these different domains. You can give access to your file servers and printers and, and resources when they are connected like this. So that was the logical unit, uh, structure. And that's just how we want to organize our Active Directory. But I would say you will probably never see a structure like this. They don't exist anymore. Maybe in the United States they could exist with very, very big companies. But otherwise we probably will just be fine with just one domain. It makes it much more simpler for us as uh, administrators. Uh, the physical structure. <coughs> Here we only have two different components, and it's sites and domain controllers. And we use this physical structure to manage the network uh, traffic and optimize the logon process. 
so we can set up if we have a company that is divided into multiple locations, we can with, with the, the, the physical structure help the user. So a user in Kalmar won't connect to a server in Lulio and try to authenticate because it will uh, take quite a lot longer if we have a, a authentication service where he lives. So <clears throat> sites we use um, to set up the different networks that we have inside our company. And they're usually a limit of the, the local area network, so the subnet. And if you only have one subnet, then you probably only have one site. You won't have to create it. It will be created when you install this service. But you can, if you have different locations, you probably will have different subnets. And then they will have different sites. And you can s specify how much of the connection uh, each site can use uh, to optimize traffic. But you, you should <coughs> realize that this Active Directory was created in the year, the late 1990s. And back then, internet connections was quite expensive. Uh, maybe you have a dial-in connection, so you haven't a connection 24-7 uh, between uh, different locations. Uh, so you won't, won't be needing to configure this as much today as you did 15, 20 years ago. Then we have the domain controller. And the domain controller is the actual physical server that runs this uh, database. It also has a lot of different services. It can authenticate users. Um, and you can have multiple domain controllers for one domain. You usually do. And then you will have load balancing. And uh, if one server goes down, the, the other can uh, be there to authenticate users. You don't have to set up anything. You just install another domain controller and it will find the, one of the others and have a multi-master replication. So when you create a user on one domain controller, it will be replicated over to the other without you having to do anything. So you usually have at least two domain controllers. Uh, without a domain controller, you can't log on. Uh, as a user. I talked about the global catalog uh, before I mentioned it. So what is that? Well, you can say that it's a, a centra centralized repository. It stores all objects in the uh, directory service, but not all the attributes. Uh, it helps with, with uh, when you're trying to log in. Uh, and it was created back when you had the structure like, like this. Because let's say we have a group here in uh, cs.lnu.se. Uh, and the group can uh, contain users from different um, domains. So it could have 15 users from that domain, it could have 2,000 users from that domain. And when we lo log, I will get to the login process, but when we log in to our computer, we'll contact one of the domain controllers and get authenticated. And then we will get uh, a ticket back that we use for saying, oh, this is me, you can trust me. And in that ticket, it also specifies which group I'm part of. So it could be easier because that's, if it's a file server that I'm trying to, uh, get a file from, it can then check, okay, are you part of this group? Okay, then you can get that. And when you log on, let's say I log on to uh, this domain with the user, and let's say I wanted to get all the groups that I'm a member of, then I would have to contact, or the service would have to contact all the different domains to get that information. But here is one of the uh, things that are stored in this global catalog. So we, can o we only contact that service and ask, OK, which membership do does this user have? And it will have that information. So to be able to, to log on, uh, if your client are connected to a domain, you need primary 
two things, and that is a domain controller to contact, to authenticate you, and a global catalog. You need that also. Usually they are installed on the same server, so we'll, it will be the same, the, the, the same server that performs this. I said most of this, yeah. <clears throat> So, installation. You should verify something called the NetBIOS name, and that is the computer name for the server that you are trying to uh, install this Active Directory on. Uh, because after you installed the, as a domain controller, it, you can change the name, but it's usually quite difficult. Uh, so. Uh, make sure that you have a, a name on the server that is uh, correct. You should also verify the TCP IP settings, so it has the correct information there. Uh, it has to be installed on an NTFS file system. Uh, we haven't talked about file systems yet, but uh, we'll talk about that more in the security lecture. Um, and then before you install, you should plan the logical and the physical structure. Um, we will set up quite a small uh, server and when you are getting out and working, this will probably already be done, been done. You probably won't be a part of the setup process for the, for the Active Directory. But we will do this in, in our labs. Um, you need, uh, DNS is quite essential to, to uh, to Active Directory, so we need a DNS server. It will, if you don't have one, it will install that as a part of the installation process. And then you add the role, Active Directory Domain Services. Then it has all the binary that it needs, but then you do something <coughs> usually called before promote to DC. You promote the, the computer, the server to a domain controller. So that's how you install your first Active Directory domain. And it's the same process if you wanted to ha add uh, additional uh, domain control, or if you wanted to add a new domain, uh, you will do the same process there. And when you have done this, you should check the DNS because it will have updated and created a lot of different um, resource records. So you can see that it has done that because otherwise, Clients and other computers won't find the domain if the DNS isn't updated. So, <clears throat> as I said, the DNS is quite essential to making Active Directory work. And Active Directory uses DNS for the clients to be able to find different services it need to authenticate. So here we can find which server has the global catalog, which server is a domain controller. So I could ask, uh, my computer is a part of a domain, so company.com. I could ask a DNS question to my name server, which domain controller should I use now to authenticate with? And in Windows, <coughs> When you install a uh, DNS, uh, when you have Active Directory, they will be integrated. So it will store all the zone information for your zones in Active Directory before they were stored on, in files and then read up to the, the memory uh, when loaded. But here they will be stored in Active Directory. And a, good, a great benefit of that is then you can secure your DNS. Because now you can say that, okay, these group of users are allowed to update our DNS. And then we could also have this, we talked about DHCP. Uh, when you get an IP address, you could update the DNS record so it reflects your computer name in your network. Here, we will make that secure because now this, the it's handled by Active Directory, so the computer has its own account in the uh, Active Directory. And when it's boot up and get a new IP, it could tell the DNS server 
a secure way to update its records. I think we will have a 15-minute break. It's a lot of information, I know, uh, and it will be hard in, until you start to install some servers. Uh, but we have a 15-minute break. Okay. <clears throat> so, when we have installed uh, the first domain controller, uh, in that setup we will be asked a lot of questions about the names and, and, uh, and how to connect to the DNS and stuff like that. But I will show that in a, in a demo uh, later on. Uh, and in the, this picture we have here, we have two domain controllers, but it's the same domain. Um, and in these domain controllers, we can create different accounts. And the easiest one uh, for you to un understand right now is a user account. Um, but every computer, uh, even if it's a an, an client or a server, you will also be able to create accounts for. But that will be done automatically when we are joining the domain, as we say. So you can join uh, both Windows and Unix systems into an Active Directory domain. But they will get different uh, features. You can't get all the features uh, uh, as you can do if, if it's a Windows uh, client or server. We usually call <coughs> servers that are uh, joined in the domain member servers. Uh, and clients, we just call uh, clients. So that when you jo join a, a, a client, to the domain, then you can use the Active Directory to authenticate users. So usually you get another different screen on your uh, PC where you choose which domain you want to log into. Uh, we will have only one in our setup because I think that's all you need. And then you will see this name or you will specify it by the domain backslash and your uh, user account or your user account, at sign, and then the name of the domain. And when you then try to authenticate, it will contact one of the domain controllers to be authenticated. And then it will be able to log on to that computer. So you usually don't create accounts for the different uh, PCs. Uh, that will be done when you're actively joining this domain. And when you join the domain, you have to specify an administrator account to be able to add new computers, of course, to it. And then the domain controller will add a computer account for that computer. So you could say that when a uh, computer boots up, it will contact the domain controller and actually authenticate itself. It has an, an account. And when we create either a user account or a computer account, they will be automatically replicated if you have multiple domain controllers. So what information can be stored in, what features do we get when we have a domain user account? Well, <clears throat> one thing is a user profile. You will have a user profile on every system that you're logging logging into, even if it's Linux or Windows or OS X, you will have something called a user profile. They may they differ quite a bit between different operating systems, and you have this even if you don't are connected to a domain or domain controller. And this stores information about your profile, like uh, the desktop environment. How should it look? Uh, which files do you have on your desktop? Uh, uh, how, which programs are installed, uh, and, and a lot of different personal settings for your account. And with an Active Directory, you could tell uh, that this user profile should be stored centralized. It w won't be stored in Active Directory. 
uh, but information where that profile is stored will be uh, in the Active Directory. So we, we can point out the file server where this information will be stored. And the benefits of that could be when I log on to this machine here, and then I make changes, I log out, and the information will be synchronized to my file server. And when I then come upstairs to my computer in my office, I will have the same information. We also have something called the home folder. And that also not, the, the, the files, files in this folder are not stored in Active Directory, but the information where my home folder is, uh, is stored in Active Directory. So this is also would be pointing at a, a file server in my network. And we have something called logon script, which is scripts that are being run when you're lo logging in or logging out of your computer. So this could be to connect different network drives or set up printers or almost anything you want it to be. These are actually stored on the domain controllers and also replicated between the different domain controllers. So we have a specific naming convention to be able to, to um, specify these, but I will show that in a demo also later on. And of course, a lot of information about your as an employee could be stored here. Your telephone number, your address, a lot of different information. And that could be used for administrators or other persons uh, at the organization if they wanted to contact you. So you could say it's a, like a phone book also for information. And this is just for a user account. There are many different tabs and, uh, and uh, information you can store here. And if your company would like some extra information here, you could just update the schema to reflect what information you wanted to be stored here. But usually we don't do that as much. Uh, there are quite a lot of fields here. So, so the logon process. Let's say I have a newly installed PC. It has some Windows version, uh, Windows 8. Um, when I install that, I will probably set up a user account on that machine so I could log in. And that will be stored locally on that machine. Uh, if I wanted this to be a part of my organization now, this domain, then I will go into the computer settings and specify that I wanted to join this domain. And this will be done by an administrator. So now when it's joined, we still usually have the local account. So if I wanted to log in locally, I could do that. But now every user that's in my domain, domain could log on if the administrator hasn't specified that only specific people could log on. But as a standard, you could log on to any system. And so the process <coughs> is like this. With what you don't see here is that on every domain controller, usually we also install the DNS service. So they also will have uh, the DNS zone added in the uh, Active Directory and be, will be loaded uh, into the, the, the domain controller when it's starting up. So both of them will have that same information. Um, and the first thing the computer does is it asks the DNS server which domain controller should I use to authenticate myself? And it will be getting back that information from the uh, DNS system. And then contact that service. It has a service called Kerberos uh, installed, who actually do the authentication process. It will then give back, I told you before, a, a sort of a ticket called a ticket granting ticket which has information about my user account and a token that I could be used to say I am authenticated in this system. 
and it also has which different groups are I'm a member of. You can be a member of thousands of, of groups. Um, okay, so I then get logged in to my system. Uh, there will be something called uh, the, the group policies will also be loading during this pro process. And they could, will be applied on my computer and my user account. So if I have some restrictions or if I had some software that was supposed to be installed when I log in, that will be done. If I then try to, let's say this is a file server. And my, I have an icon on my desktop, which is a reference to a folder on this file server. I will use my ticket to authenticate myself. So I don't have to contact the domain controllers again for doing this. And this file server is also a member of the, um, the domain. And on the specific share, we have specified maybe, OK, users in this group, a group that is uh, added on the domain controllers, they have read access to this directory. So when he gets his ticket, he will say, OK, you are part of this group. You could read files here. Uh, and he uses this ticket for different services around the system. It could be a printer, a file server, as you saw here, or almost anything. It could be if we had an, uh, an uh, application that we have de developed that uses single sign-on, he will be authenticated there also. So as you see, <coughs> this is a, a system that helps administrator quite a lot. Let's say if we have a company with 100 employees, and if we didn't have something called something, some directory service, we will have to manage user account on each different system, and we will have to have all the users uh, created on the file servers and have them authenticate there. It would not be possible. You need something, some sort of uh, directory service to manage this. So I've been talking a bit about groups. And we use groups uh, a lot when we give access to different parts of the system. We don't give uh, access to a specific user account. We can do that, but then another person who has the same uh, job as the other user, you have to add that user also, and then go on and go on and go on. So we use groups to group up people. Or it could be a uh, computer account also. but. Um, they are created on the domain controller, and they are stored in the Active Directory. So it, it's an, a resource that lives there. And we use this to uh, grant access to different parts of the system. But we do that as an administrator. It is me who, who are applying this group to the specific task that I wanted to do, be access to. So let's say a printer. Then I will use a group, domain group. Uh, and say that users in this group will have access to the printer. Then another administrator could add the users that are, have, should have access to that printer and doesn't have to go to the printer and make settings there. So <clears throat> I say before, but if we use this big system where we have trees and forests, uh, in that time, it would be, be possible to have groups that could have members from all the different parts of the organization. It would be very hard to both manage and a lot of resources will be used for that task. So they have divided the different groups in, into three different groups. We have domain local groups, global groups, and universal groups. And the domain local groups uh, can only be used as uh, uh, authorization within the single domain. So what do we mean by that? Well, let's say you have seen these triangles. They usually are symbol for the domain. So we have a domain, 
And in the domain, uh, we have a, a server, a file server, that has uh, some shares. And let's say it has a share for sales. So all the sales uh, the people should store data there. And the sales, let's say that we have a subdomain, have another domain. And we have users both in this domain and this domain who wanted to have access to this share. Uh, then we could have a domain local group that it can only give authorization within its domain. So this share, when I try to apply this group to make, OK, you can read this, this folder, I won't be able to see uh, domain local groups in other domains. So if I created a domain local group in this domain, I won't be able to give access uh, to my resources in my domain. I can only use a group with this a domain local group within this domain. So it can only give access to resources within the domain. But members could come from both or all of the different domains. So I could within this group add members from the whole forest. Then we have the global groups, which is, which is the other way around. Here we can have only have members from within the domain, but I could have a global group on, uh, on that and give access to my file server here. And then we have the universal group, which is both sides, both benefits. So why don't we always create universal groups? That would have been much easier. Well, that was in the beginning when, because all the universal groups are stored in the global catalog. Because we need to have know where the members are coming from. And in the beginning, it wasn't possible to have at, uh, uh, all these objects within that global catalog. Today, that's not a problem either. So we usually use universal groups. But you can use the other one. And there are workarounds. I will talk about this when I talk about security. We could skip the universal and just use the other two and still get the same effect. Um, but you should <coughs> realize these different types because sometimes when you are trying to, uh, let's say that you have a printer and wanted to give access for this printer. Okay, I know a, a, a global group uh, which I can use. But if that global group was created on another, no, the domain local group was created on another domain, you won't see it. You see all the other groups, but not that, th th those groups. To complicate matters more, they all, each group also has a, a range. So a domain local group can be uh, either a distribution group or a security group. And that's also for universal group and, and global groups. Uh, and what is the difference? Well, the distribution groups were essentially made for email lists. So we could say that we have a department uh, for the marketing team. And then we have all the users from marketing. It doesn't depend in which city. Uh, they are all connected to this group. Then we can use that for sending email to that group. Uh, but each object <coughs> in Active Directory that we use for a security purpose. Uh, we want to authenticate uh, something or uh, could we use this resource? They have something called the SID, the security identifier. And the distribution group doesn't have that. So you can't add a distribution group for security purposes, for authorization purposes. They are only used for grouping people, essentially when you use them for email. So you will probably never use this group if you're not administrating the exchange environment in Active Directory we will probably always use the security group. But the, bit, the, the main difference is that one has the SID and one doesn't. 
and without the SID, you can't be applied to the uh, access control list, the a uh, ACL. And each object uh, in Windows, which you can give authorization to, has some sort of ACL. But this will be more clear when we I show this in a demo. <clears throat> there are a lot of different groups. Uh, when you install the first domain, you will have a lot of different groups uh, there already. Uh, but there are some special groups which you probably don't see when you are trying to uh, look inside Active Directory. They are called implicit groups. And they are groups that are, are used uh, or represent users in different contexts. And we can use this when we want to give authorization of some sort. Let's say that I wanted to have this, this share that should be public for all users in, in uh, my domains then I could use the authenticated user group and give access for that group. Because every person who are authenticated in some way are a part of that group, without me as an administrator having to add them. So when you are <coughs> logged in, it doesn't matter from which domain, you are authenticated. And then hence you will be in the authenticated user group. Uh, we have a, another which is quite special, which is creative, creator owner. So let's say I create a file on a file server. Then I would be creative owner. I will be a part of creative owner group. Uh, and another user will not be that until when he creates a, a file in that folder. And then he will be creator owner for that file. And so me as an administrator can control which people are member of the group. They are implicitly uh, added uh, during uh, a specific context. Um, these are only examples. Uh, so there are quite a lot more if you want to use them. Uh, you should just uh, search for it and you will find some. Uh, I talked a bit about this extra domain controller. You do the same as you did with the first installation. <clears throat> and you do this for redundancies and load balancing. So if I install two domain controllers, they will share the load for all the authentication uh, and other stuff around that. We also use them if we have uh, companies spread out on different locations. And that could be if we, <coughs> if we have a um, uh, tunnel to the main office and if it go down, we still want users to be able to log on to their systems. So then we have to have a domain controller on their location. Uh, you will have some difference. You won't be adding names for the domain, of course, when you add an extra domain controller. But you will be asked if you wanted to install the DNS and if it should have the global catalog. And if you wanted this to work without it having contact with the, the, the main office, you will have to install the global catalog and DNS. Otherwise, the computers in the local area network won't find the service and won't be able to authenticate itself. They have a, different, a special one called read-only domain controller. <coughs> that is a special mode. And you can't add uh, objects to that. So if I connect to it as an administrator, I still can't create objects on it. And it won't store the password hashes. So if it gets stolen, and they some way will be able to get into the database and extract the user information, they won't be able to get the password because they are not stored on that server. Uh, as you realize then, if I have a read-only domain controller, then the users can't authenticate if they don't have a server uh, that is are online from the main office. But you could specify, OK, I want these 10 people, their password should be stored on the server. 
So you could have the people that are working in that office, their password could be stored there. And if that server got stolen, then we have just one command to run and the password will be resetted for those that were cached on the read-only domain controller. Uh, so you only use that if you have limited physical security in a location. Okay, quite a lot of information. Um, so, for most of you, when you're talking about Active Directory, it will primarily be about authentication, a centralized authentication service. <clears throat> um, we have limited support when we come to other operating systems than Windows. We can use this uh, centralized authentication service that will be working for uh, most of uh, today's operating systems. But group policy and stuff like that will not work. Um, and DNS is very important for DNS to be, to be working. So there are some big takeaways. And I, I realize that this is quite a lot to take in. Uh, hopefully some of you will uh, join us in the group discussion afterwards. And maybe I can clarify some things. Uh, otherwise, we will have some demos on this probably in, in two weeks, because we have to go through web servers and uh, DNS uh, some more before that in the demos. Uh, but if we don't have any question, I think that's it for today. Okay, see you in five minutes in the Discord room.